The Dutch stumbled across it, and the Spanish, probably even the French. But Cook, Captain James Cook of Yorkshire, England, he came looking for it. A legendary continent in the South Seas. And when he found it, he claimed it for his king. That was just 200 years ago. Things have been happening since then. Now it's a country of 12 million. Some are just learning their first words of English. Others, not many, can go back six generations to the first settlement. But they all fit into a pattern, one way or another. How do you tell someone what it's like? Not the country. That's easy enough to describe. But the people. Well, the fact is, the typical Australian, if there is such a person, probably isn't all that different from the typical city dweller anywhere in the world. Because in spite of what the rest of the world believes, that's where most of them live and work in the cities. The early settlers used to complain about the quiet. Not even the birds sang. Well, something has been done to overcome that. It's not a rural economy any longer, at least not primarily. Once, even 20 years ago, perhaps it was, but not now.
couldn't make a thing out of it. Go on, you mate. The climate of a place is supposed to affect a person's character. Well, the climate is pretty mild, at least around the coast, where most of the big cities are. And the people seem to spend a lot of time out in it. With his hammer swinging and his anvil ringing, he fashioned bells from a cross-cut blade. And while he toiled by the Condamine River, he sang a song for a job well done. And the song and the clamor of his busy hammer, they merged and mingled in a tempered tone. Migrants have changed things a bit. Nearly two million of them in the last 20 years. They've given new flavors, new color, new character. The ceremony itself may be new, but to most Australians, it's only a variation on one of his favorite occupations, marching. We want democracy. 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 That's for sure. Have a go at that bearded one. We don't want to do all this. We want the most of They don't claim to have invented the march, only to have developed and refined it to express anything they may be feeling at the time. They work, most of them, in the cities and live in the surrounding suburbs. But high density living is the choice of only a few. For the majority, the great Australian dream still persists. A house of one's own with a garden back and front. cost of labor is the reason usually given for the fact that most Australians seem to spend a good deal of their spare time improving or maintaining their domain. But it's also a part of the national character. The specialist is distrusted. They're a race of do-it-yourselfers.
around down with Fox. <laughs> They like to gamble, but most of them would find the elegance of a European casino uncomfortable. The local version is the cooperative club. The summers are long and dry, and spare time is spent out, even if it takes half a day to get there. Summers are long and dry. And sometimes this is a mixed blessing. Oh, the two kids to close all hers up, and we come back and it was 
thought this in a matter of seconds you couldn't get through. Look at what's wrong. The outback, they call it, or sometimes the bush. Though often there's nothing taller than a blade of spinifex grass as far as the eye can see. It's a different Australia. It hasn't really changed much for more than a century. Not many Australians really know it. Name. You know, when I call his name, the dog comes out that I want. He don't, doesn't muck around. You know, the wrong dog comes out and make him jump back in. <whistles> Behind him, man. Lazy like this, I think. You've got to, you've got to get used to sitting around doing nothing. And you've got to see everything and hear everything. That's the first thing you learn with drivers. You've got to see everything. You've got to see the sheep in front of you and behind you, and you've got to look. You've got to see things that are coming and going. You sort of just can't ride along with your mob. You've got to be riding and watching all the time. Motorbike makes it a lot easier. But then uh, you've got to have a good dog if you've got a motorbike, because if your motorbike breaks down, which they do, if it breaks down, well, there you're stuck on foot and only you like to have about 4,000 sheep. Well, you've got to have a good dog to, to work them then. Whereas the horse, he, he, he just doesn't. He keeps going all the time. <laughs> a good engine in him. Drovers are the biggest thieves going, you know. The, the station owner will be there talking to me. My dog will be out of the fence getting sheep. <laughs> <laughs> there's no good anybody saying there's honest drover, you know, because it would be there be talking there telling the station now and now honest you and your dog be over the fence bring a little mob of sheep up for you get a killer out of them then again they're awake because they know if they muster a paddock where a driver's been throwing the sheep missing the first thing they say that bloody driver got them All Australia used to ride on the sheep's back once, the golden fleece. Now minerals make the big money, but the sheep and the sheds and the shearers will be around for a long time yet.
They're tough men, seasonal nomads. Most of them still wear the dark blue work singlets known as Jackie Howes, named after the greatest blade shearer of them all. Up in Queensland, more than 75 years ago, he shore 321 merinos with hand shears in 20 minutes short of an eight-hour working day. Nobody's ever beaten that record. The land's dry, the work's hard, and the distances are great. Sometimes a town isn't much more than a place that can serve a cold beer. Once a year, even to the smallest town in the remotest part of the country, people will come six, seven hundred, even a thousand miles just to attend the annual picnic race meeting. It's all the social events of the city rolled into one. Oh, my God. 
go magic. Look where I take a sword, and while you are standing as close as you are now, I cut a young lady's head completely off. You see the head alive without a body. It talks to it, it paint you. At your command, I will make it disappear and reappear just as many times as you'd like to say. Now those in first get the best position, so if you care to go, look, there's the pay box down there. All right, girls, you go in free, Jimmy Breaches, and we'll start this show straight away. Now push your way in if you want to see the session. Maybe the final show of the afternoon, hurry girls and hurry boys. All right, here We have Jill in our now, in our favorite navy and white combination. It's a Dacron and Cotton, John J. Hilton, and it's a honey, suitable for the teenager. It's soft and feminine, and of course it's drip dry. This is from Les Femmes, and is priced $24. After the show and the races, of course, you always get the ball, the big ball. And it's a great occasion, and even if the place is filled with burrs and bull dust and blowflies, it's still a terrific night for everybody. Country women, they're rather special people, I think. For the first hundred years of our history, men outnumbered women by about ten to one. So the women who went into the outback with their men to help them win the land were brave, rare creatures. I feel that something of their fibre and endurance still survives among the country women of today, now that the land has been won, but still has to be held. Now, the, the council meeting, we did have 17 branches in our in our group, but we've lost one. Collarina has unfortunately had to close, and that leaves us with 16. There were 15 branches represented, and they, uh, the Collarina gave the balance of their money towards the three Aboriginal scholarships that the group has. Now, where they are, we have one here, one is in Trangy, and one is in Coolabar. We make our money by street stalls, by competitions, and we have a carnival through the year and we do quite well at the carnival, but mostly street stalls all. We uh, work for the race meetings, we do the afternoon tea, but the money that we do make is all made through sheer hard work just from a handful of people. Most of the members will give, and they give willingly, but of course lots of our members are seniors and they can't do the hard work, so it's really left to just a few people. But it's all done so willingly. Everybody loves working for it. And we really are a very happy band of women. I didn't mention anything about that today, Edna. We'll bring it up the next meeting. What's that? About the uh, money. You know, the pay for the door. Ah, exactly. They're all sitting there. They're really Please, ladies, don't forget to tell the press what a lovely afternoon we have with you. In a country this size, where the sparse thing is people, there is always, of course, a special problem about education. The main reason for the forming of the school in Wilmeringle was the break-up of the original station. 
that was Wilmeringle station, which I believe was something over 500,000 acres. These large properties were cut up into smaller blocks, balloted and sold off. Well, this brought a new influx of people into the district, more families, and they required education. The children live at Wilmeringle, but their fathers cannot get work here all the time, and they have to move around. Most of them, of course, are seasonal workers. They would then go across over to Burke if there was any work of a seasonal nature there, and the children would go too, and then they come back. And this is where we have to try and teach the individual child and not say, this is a, a class, and we will teach this class one set of work, because they'll miss half of it, a quarter of it, now when the child comes back and sits in the classroom, you've got to revise what he's already had and then go on from where he left off. The next one. Uncle John came from America. Uncle John came from America. Oh, I think they're sort of deprived in one way. They just haven't got the experiences that city children would have. Well, I loved the West. I was teaching down Wollongong for three years. And I found it... Oh, quite an enjoyable place, but not as sociable as the West is, and the people out the West are wonderful and very friendly. Then along came the middle Billy Goat Gruff. Who's that walking on my bridge? We're going to come up and eat you. All right, then. Then along came the big Billy Goat Gruff. Up you come. Stand hard. Who's that walking on my bridge? We're going to come up there and eat you. You go up and eat him. No, you go up and eat him, then. And the big Billy Goat Gruff bunted the wicked old troll right into the river and off he went across the other side. All a young person ever asks is to be born into a time of promise. And this Australia has, whatever it doesn't have, it has promise and the young are part of the promise. And I think they're a very good part of it. <laughs> Preparation one and two, pirouette and hold it, go into breath, bend over and hold it. Right. Two and one and two, three, hold it four, promenade five, six, seven, boys arm eight, one, bring the arms under two, don't rush. Three and four. 
More than 60% of Australians are under 30. So it's a country of the young, really, and we'll wake up to that one day. Before the horn comes in. You once again, please. I think the surfy cult in Australia is about the closest we've got to this private stoicism, pantheistic in a way, that we used to identify with the Anzac heritage, the digger thing. Whatever it is, it's finally the man and the sea and the sun. The sea and the sun always permeate everything in Australia, but it's the man and the sea and the sun and a private contest. 
Well, there's, there's sort of a, a string of beaches that just about any, any, every guy that goes up and down he goes to, like here in Angari, and Coolangatta, then the north coast, right. then the central coast, and you go through Sydney, down the south coast of Sydney, and Victoria. It just, just seems to be, you know, like a circuit, more or less, I suppose you could call it. Oh, you save oh, up a lot of brass. Save up a fair bit of brass. You can stay in one place and work for a few weeks. You can get a sort of a casual job. And it's not, you know, you live pretty cheap when you're moving. Something like a dollar a day trying to Something like that, you know. You can live pretty well. But in some towns you go to, you know, you can get on to some really decent chicks that take you home for tea every night and all this sort of thing, you know. <laughs> when we're at the bay, we've got free meals every second night and she bought us corn, big packets of corn flakes and butter and bread. Oh, it was out of sight. She put them on her oldies account. <laughs> we had a really gas time. <laughs> we stayed there for how long? Six weeks or something. <laughs> <laughs> I often wonder what Captain Cook would think of it if he could see it now. What he would think of these Australians. Australians are everything. Australians are old and young and middle-aged. Australians are tough and tender, hard and soft. They're ugly and beautiful and they're all sorts of people. But they're Australians. There's some curious quality about them that is identifiable. It's some quality they've developed out of the country and its mad beauty and its problems and this way of life and it is quite distinct from anybody else. <laughs> 